okay? Exponential functions. And um, I wanna start this with an example, okay? And uh, a very uh, good example of this is when you deal with the growth rate of um, uh, microorganisms like bacteria. So if you start with just one bacterium in a Petri dish, there it is, and, we, and then we track how much bacteria there is after a certain amount of time. Well, the way bacteria um, replicates itself is that it just splits, right? After it collects enough uh, nutrients, it splits into two more bacteria. So one, one bacteria will split into two, and then each of those bacteria will split into two more, and so on and so on. And so it just grows and grows and grows. So suppose that this bacteria that we have uh, doubles after every hour, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a table with T for time, and then I'm gonna have a function B of T to represent the amount of bacteria after T hours. Okay, so T is measured in hours, B of T is the amount of bacteria after that many hours. So after zero hours, we started with one bacterium, all right? So the amount of bacteria is gonna be one. After one hour, this one bacteria is going to split into two more. So this guy is going to replicate and become two bacteria. So this is after zero hours, this is after one. So after one hour, we now have two bacteria. After two hours, these are going to double. So each one of these is gonna double. So after two hours, we have four bacterium, bacteria. Mixing up my singular and plural here. And uh, after three hours, each one of these is going to double. And now I have eight bacteria. And it keeps going, right? I can't really draw anymore. You can see it starts getting very many very fast. But I can see what's going, what's going on mathematically. Each time I go from one level time point to the next, I'm just doubling the amount that I had previously. So when I go to the next level, after four hours, I'm going to double the eight and have 16 bacteria. Um, after five hours, I'm going to double that and have 32 bacteria. Okay, so the bacteria is growing and growing and growing and growing and, and it gets, starts growing faster and faster the more there is. And eventually it'll fill up that Petri dish. Okay, so the question is, can we come up with a formula for the amount of bacteria after X hours? Can we see the relationship from the first column to the second? Well, one thing you might notice is um, that one can be written as two to the zero power. Two can be written as two to the first power. Four can be written as two to the second power. Eight, two to the third. Sixteen, two to the fourth. Thirty-two, two to the fifth. And this makes sense because to get from one to the next, we multiply by two. And every time you multiply by two, you increment the exponent by one. So this should make sense here. And we can see what, what's going to happen, how, this is, how these columns are related. It's going to tell us what happens for any value of time. We can see that this number is exactly the exponent, the one over here. So after x hours, we're going to have 2 to the x bacteria. So this is an example of an exponential function. And I could write that down uh, as the amount of bacteria after x hours is 2 to the power x. Okay. Now, what does an exponential function look like in general? Well, um, an exponential function is a function of the form. In this case, I used b. I'm going to use a lowercase f for this function. It's f of x equals some number raised to the power x. In this case, my number was 2, right? But it could be a different number. But it can't be any number. It can't be anything. 
this number here has to be positive and it can't be equal to one. Okay. So where B is positive and B is not equal to one. So as long as it's a positive number not equal to one, this is what we call an exponential function. And it's used to model things like growth rates, like this. Um, they use it to measure the spread of the, you've probably heard that the, uh, the, uh, the coronavirus has exponential growth. It's expanding, the, the rate of infection grows exponentially, right? Um, and, or the amount of cases grows exponentially. I'm not sure, I don't think the rate grows exponentially, but the amount of cases uh, of, of um, COVID-19 infections uh, they grow uh, exponentially. Um, when they deal with, when you deal with things like um, radioactive decay, uh, when things decay, they can decay at an exponential rate. So radioactive substances and things have this behavior. Okay. So let's just look at some other examples and just make sure we can identify what is and what is not an exponential function. Okay, so um, let's just say, is it an exponential function. All right, so here's, here's my examples. Examples uh, one, two, three through, uh, I got six lined up here. Okay, so my first example is gonna be four to the x. Next example will be x to the three. Next example would be negative five dx. Got square root of x. Um, one over two to the x. And eight to the negative x. These are the functions I wanna look at. We wanna see, are they exponential functions? Well, let's look at this first one here. Four to the x. Let's see, does it match this description. Well, it's something raised to the power x, so that's good. Is that something positive? Yep, four is positive. Is it not equal to one? Yep, four is not equal to one. So yes, this is an exponential function. What about the next one here, x cubed? It looks like it's got all the ingredients, right? Three is uh, positive, it's not equal to one. The problem is, is that the, the x and the three are in the wrong place, right? Exponential function has to have the variable in the exponent and the number down here. This is the wrong way around. So that is not an exponential function. And we know what kind of function this is. This is a polynomial. Sometimes we call this a monomial because it's a polynomial with only one term. But it's not an exponential function. That variable has to be in the exponent. Let's look at the next one here. Well, we got the variable in the exponent. This number is not equal to one, so that's good. Problem is, this number is not positive, right? So it fails this condition over here. That b is negative five here, it's not positive, so that actually does not qualify. Let's go over to this one. X, the uh, square root of x, well, you might say, well, how could that possibly be? You might try saying, well, this is the same as x to the one half. We know that's true. But then we run into the same problem we had over here, right? Uh, for the same reason x cubed is not an exponential function, neither is x to the one half. So, no. What about one over two to the x? Well, uh, it looks like it's not really close yet. I mean, it's got one over, so how do we fix that? Well, we know that one over two to the x is the same thing as um, well, what can we do here? Um, let's see. Uh, I, can, I can write this as uh, 1 over 2 to the power x. The reason I can do that is because we know that when you do this, the x comes to the numerator and it comes to the denominator. Right? 1 to any power is just 1. Right, so that just makes the one up here. 
and two to the x just makes the two to the x down here. So when I write it like this, I see that it is an exponential function with b equal to a half. Right? So I got one half to the x power. That works because one half is positive and one half is not equal to one. So this is actually an exponential function. I just had to rewrite it a different way. What about eight to the minus x? Well, that doesn't look quite right because I got a negative sign here, but can I rewrite it in a way that that negative sign doesn't appear? Well, we know that from properties of exponents that when you have a negative exponent, you can make it positive by moving the quantity to the denominator. So this is the same as one over eight to the x. That's just from properties of exponents. And then we can do the same thing we did here. One over eight to the x is the same thing as one eighth to the power x. So if the, if the negative was outside the parentheses, you had something like this, negative one times five to the x. So the way exponential function is defined here, it wouldn't be an exponential function because we've got this extra piece out here. Now, in other books, they will call this an exponential function. It depends on the book that you're using. In our textbook, it's not. But mm -hmm. if you look in other textbooks or if you look online, some people may call this an exponential function because some people allow there to be another constant out front. Okay, so these are just some examples. Um, what I wanna do, I wanna look at uh, some graphs of exponential functions and just see what's going on with these guys, okay? Um, we can kind of see what was happening here, get, a, get an idea of what the graph looks like. As I just increment on the t-axis, let's just kind of make a quick sketch here. This is my t-axis, and I'm looking at b of t. So I got one, two, three, four, five. When, when, when t is zero, I'm at height one, right? When t is one, I'm at height two. When t is two, I'm double that. Like four. When t is three, I'm double that. I'm way up here. I'm already off the chart here. You can see it's growing very fast. Right? So you can see it's curving upwards and it's growing very, very, very fast. And this is why when people talk about exponential, you know, the rate of, of, of COVID-19 infections growing exponentially, it's cause for great concern because this is, it's doubling every hour in this case. That's, that's nuts. That's growing super, super fast. But let's take a look at some of these uh, graphs in more detail. I'm going to do this on the computer. Let's, let's, uh, so I've got x squared, and then I'm also going to plot 2 to the x, okay? So I'm going to turn that on, and that's going to be in blue. So you can see the, the blue curve represents 2 to the x, the exponential function. Now let's compare how they look. Uh, they look kind of the same to the right of 0, right? But to the left of zero, you can see they're doing very different things. The exponential functions just keeps going down closer and closer to the y-axis, the x-axis, but never gets there. It's always slightly above, right? Whereas the parabola just goes up on both sides. It looks like the parabola is actually growing faster than the exponential function over here. The parabola overtakes the exponential function. Does that keep happening? That's a question. Well, if we keep going here, we keep going and going and going, we see that in fact, the exponential function wins out. The exponential function, the blue curve, actually gets higher than the parabola. Didn't look like it at first, but if you look up far enough, you can see the blue curve wins. The blue curve is growing faster than the red curve. And this is a property that all exponential functions have. Um, this, this exponential function will grow faster than any polynomial. It doesn't have to be x squared, it could be x to the 10th, it could be x to the 100th. No matter how big I make this exponent here, the exponential function will win. It will eventually get bigger because exponential growth is much faster than polynomial growth. Um, and that's something that that exponential functions, uh, that's a nice, that's an interesting property that they have. And that's why people talk about how serious exponential growth is. Graphs of exponential functions. 
Um, what we saw was a graph of the function y equals b to the x. And in that case, b was greater than 1. Okay? I had a 2 there. And there's going to be a difference. We're going to draw another graph for the case b is less than 1. B has to be positive, but it could be less than one or greater than one. So in the case where B is greater than one, okay, this is the picture that we saw. And what we saw was that it crossed here at one. And that's always going to be the case because if you raise um, a number, a non-zero number to the zero power, we know that we always get one. Okay, so this is always gonna be one for every single exponential function we can conceive of. So that's an important thing to remember. It always crosses here at one. We also see that this line, the x-axis, is, is a line that the function approaches as we go to negative values of x. What that means is that this line is a um, horizontal asymptote. An asymptote is a line that a graph approaches. It may not reach that line ever, and that's the case here. It never actually gets to the x-axis, but it gets closer and closer and closer the further you go to the left. And this x-axis has the equation y equals zero. Now, what's the situation when b is less than one? Actually, maybe we should just go back to the computer and take a look. And uh, I'm gonna look at different values for b here. So here's what it looks like when b is two. Let me get this. If I make b bigger, what's gonna happen? Well, the graph gets steeper. And that should make sense because you're, you're raising larger numbers to a power, you should, get very, you should get even bigger numbers, right? So you can see as b gets large, it gets steeper and steeper. When b starts to decrease and gets close to one, you can see it gets flattens out a little bit. B is not allowed to equal one because at that point it just becomes a straight horizontal line. But it still makes sense. It's just we don't call it an exponential function. Look what happens when B dips below one. Oh, look at this. It flips. It does the same thing it was doing before, but it's on the other side. And when B is a half, it's actually the mirror image of when B was equal to two. And we can think about why that's the case. This is exactly a mirror image of when the b equal of the b equal two case. So when b is less than one, we get a graph that decreases from left to right. So when b is less than one, we know it still has to go through zero comma one. It's y intercept is always zero comma one. In fact, maybe I should put that down since we've talked about y intercepts before. That's the y-intercept, 0 comma 1. Same thing here, except now our function looks like, oops, looks like that, right? So it decreases from left to right. Still has a horizontal asymptote. That's still the case. Still has a y-intercept 0 comma 1, but the graph decreases from left to right instead of increases. This is called exponential decay. This one up here is called exponential growth. So two different behaviors we can see with exponential functions. So it either grows very fast or it decays very fast. There's one special type of exponential function that comes when we use a very special number for b. And that number, we call it the number e and it's called the natural base. E is the number uh, 2.71828, uh, 1827 dot dot, that keeps going forever. There's no pattern to these digits. 
It's like pi, 3.14159, blah, blah, blah. There's no pattern to those digits. It's an irrational number, but this decimal expansion goes on and on forever. And it's a very special number. Um, and we use it an awful lot in mathematics and in chemistry and physics and engineering. And um, when you use that as your base for your exponential function, we call that the natural exponential function. So the natural exponential, uh, exponential function looks like e to the x. So it's this number between two and three. It's an irrational number that is very special and has lots of nice properties. And we'll talk about where that, one of the places that number comes up, comes from uh, a little bit later. Okay. Another uh, fact about exponential functions that we need to discuss is the fact that exponential functions are one-to-one -one functions. And this is gonna help us solve equations involving exponential functions. So exponential functions are one-to-one. -one. What does that mean? Well, let me show you some functions that aren't one-to-one, -one, and then maybe that will help elucidate what, what we're talking about here. So, um, functions that aren't one-to-one. -one. So let's look at, um, our first example will be f of x equals x squared, that guy. f of x equals x squared, we saw a picture of it earlier, it's the parabola, looks like this. If I take a value on the y-axis, say the number four, I can ask what values of x correspond to that value of y. In other words, what are the solutions to f of x equals four? Or what numbers when squared give me four? Well, there's two numbers that when squared gives me four. There's uh, x equals negative two, and there's x equals positive two. I can get those numbers by going over to the graph and going down to the x-axis. Here's two, here's negative two. There are two numbers uh, corresponding to this one number. And so that means it's not one to one, it's two to one. So this is a, a two to one, fun well, it's not, I wouldn't say it's two to one everywhere. There are some numbers like zero that have only one number corresponding to them, but it's not a one to one function because there are some numbers like two and negative two, they both get sent to the same place by the function f. So f takes two here and negative two there. So it's not one to one. Another function that's not one-to-one -one would be something like um, f of x equals, um, I'm gonna do something different, but let's try this one. Let's try sine x, okay, let's look at this guy. Sine x looks like this. In fact, this function is infinite to one, right? If I take a value here, um, let me take a, a simple value right up here at the top. I'll take the number one. There's lots of values that correspond to one. All these values here, 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 and it goes on. This function oscillates infinitely often, forever. And so uh, I have infinitely many values that get sent to one. What are these numbers? Well, this is, pi over two, um, this is um, five pi over two, this one let's see it's minus pi over two, minus pi, minus three pi over two, there's lots of them. So all these numbers, um, let's start with the least one, negative three pi over two, pi over two, uh, five pi over two, all these numbers, and there are more, right? they all get sent to one. So it's not a one-to-one -one function, it's infinite to one. There's lots of functions that get sent to a single number here. And you can take any number in this range and that'll be the case 
right? Well, exponential functions are one-to-one. -one. If I look at, uh, so done with the not one-to-one -one functions, let's look at the, our exponential function. Okay. It's either gonna look like this, if b is greater than one, or it's gonna look like this, if b is less than one, right, we know that. But look at what happens. If I take any number here on the y-axis, there's only one number corresponding to it on the x-axis in either picture. And that makes it a one-to-one -one function. And um, because of that, that means that we have this nice property. If b to the x equals b to the y, so if the outputs are the same, then the inputs must have been the same. x must have equaled y. That's a property that one-to-one -one functions have that these other functions that we looked at don't have this property. Just because the two function values are the same doesn't mean they came from the same place. In fact, this one up here, the sign came from many different places to equal one. But here, if the two outputs are the same, the inputs must have also been the same. And so this will allow us to solve equations that look like this. We can solve an equation that looks like this by using this property and writing down a simpler equation. Okay, so let's take a uh, look at some examples where we use this property. The book calls this the one-to-one -one property. So let's take a look at some examples where we have to solve equations using the one-to-one -one property. So we have two, uh, these are, uh, this is an exponential function um, with x minus three plugged in in place of x. This is an exponential function with one plugged in in place of x. Okay. In other words, what I can do is I can write that uh, this. Now, what did the one-to-one -one property say? The one-to-one -one property said that if b to the x equals b to the y, then x equals y. Okay. So if seven to the x minus three equals seven to the one, that implies that x minus three must equal one. And so we can solve this for x. Right? We just add three to both sides, x equals four. Right? So we got our answer by using the one-to-one -one property. It essentially allows you to strip off the exponents and just treat them separately. Let's look at another one, a little bit more challenging. We'll do um, three to the three X minus two equals 81. All right, this one um, isn't as obvious because here the bases were the same. I had a seven here and a seven here. Here they're different but I can view them as the same because I can write 81 as a power of three. 81 is actually three to the fourth power. So let's write it like that. Oh, see now that I have the same base, the bases are the same. I know that from the one-to-one -one property of exponential functions, I know that three X minus two must equal four. And that's just the one-to-one -one property. And now I can solve this by adding two to both sides, dividing both sides by three. And my answer is X equals two. Right. And you can plug these numbers in and check, right? If I take two and plug it in, I get two, three times two is six, minus two is four. Three to the fourth equals 81. I'm gonna check this one too. Plug four in here for x. Four minus three is one. Seven to the one equals seven. It checks out. It never hurts to check your answer. 
Okay, let's look at another one. The last example where we'll be using this one-to-one -one property. Um, I have e to the x squared. Remember, e is just a number. E is just some number, 2.7 something. That's what you should remember. Okay, so here we have e to the x squared divided by e to the x equals e to the six. What can we do here? Well, we need to get it in that form that we can use the one-to-one the -one property. So I need to have a single e to the something over here. Well, I can do that because I know properties of exponents tell me that when I divide, I subtract the exponents. So the first thing I'll do is use that. This is the same as e to the x squared minus x. Okay, and what can I do next? Well, now I can use the one-to-one -one property because if these two things are equal, the exponents must have been equal. So x squared minus x must equal six. How do I solve this? Well, we've talked about lots of methods for solving this. Completing the square works. Um, you could uh, situate this so you could use the quadratic formula, but I think factoring is the easiest way to go. Just subtract six from both sides. Factor the left-hand side. And our two solutions just pop right out, right? The thing that makes this zero is x equals three. The thing that makes this zero is x equals negative two. So there are two solutions here. And you can check them out. If I plug 3 in here, I got e to the 9, right, because 3 squared is 9, divided by e to the 3. When I divide, I subtract the exponents, 9 minus 3 is 6, so that works. And what about the negative 2? Well, negative 2 squared is 4, so I have e to the 4, divided by e to the negative 2, so I have 4 minus negative 2, 4 minus negative 2 is 6, so again, it checks out. So both of these do indeed work. Um, I thought I'd do that. I said that would be the last one, but let me do one more because it just occurred to me there's another neat uh, thing that can happen. Maybe do we do five to the x? Um, this will be quick. Five to the x equals one because this one there's no five on the right hand side. So what do we do here? Well, you can still do it, right? Because you can write one with with the base five, right? One is five to the zero power. So the one-to-one -one property says that x must be equal to zero. So very quick there.